Merci beaucoup pour l'organisateur. Uh, uh, thank you, Hervé and Muriel, for inviting me. And, uh, well, I'm going to give a very wide uh, overview about meteorites, but also about uh, bodies from which the meteorites are coming from. And I hope it uh, will be, in general, useful as the rest of the talks. This will be available as a PDF file. So you will realize that uh, there is some explanation of every slide with the intention of uh, going through the matter, the main ideas uh, that I'm going to explain. Probably some of the slides I'm not going in deep detail about everything is in the, in the slide, but of course you are very welcome at the very end or during the beer time or whatever <laughs> to ask me about uh, any of these contents and I'm happy to, of course, show you on the computer again and explain uh, the things, uh, because I want you to retain more or less the essence. Eh? And you will see, uh, my, I will say my focus here is that you uh, really realize how important are meteorites in our knowledge, not only of the formation of the solar system, formation of the planets, if not in our, our own presence in the cosmos. Eh? So I'm trying to link uh, meteorites with astrobiology. Uh, just to put uh, you in, in context, I will just show you a very fast uh, slide. Um, this is the, the institute uh, I belong. It's the Institute of Space Sciences in Barcelona. Uh, it's an excellent insti institute of the Upper Research Council in, in Catalonia. Uh, that uh, I have uh, several PhD students, some already doctorate, uh, with uh, some of the results of these doctorates uh, are shown in this slide, so it's um, also their fault. <laughs> and, uh, well, in our main group lines are concerning, uh, for example, the recovery and characterization of new meteorites. We have uh, recover and characterize some of the last Spanish falls, but also uh, falls in South America uh, and where we are working also on the characterization of uh, new finds. At the same time, um, we are the only uh, institute in Spain that has expertise in uh, NASA Antarctic uh, meteorites. We are an uh, international repository of NASA Antarctic meteorites that uh, will provide many of these fascinating results. I will explain you later. And then um, we are working with a special interest in aqueous alteration, in the action of water in different environments. Um, for sure, in asteroids and um, bodies that we can call transitional, mid asteroid, mid uh, comet. And uh, also uh, in planetary bodies like, for example, Mars uh, or uh, other places. Um, and we are also performing laboratory experiments to gain insight about the different processes taking place in, in these bodies. Uh, not only aqueous alteration, we are also dealing with uh, collisional compaction, um, shock affecting and uh, transforming the minerals. Um, and we are also um, working on issues related with impact hazard, um, the influence of all this evolutionary track of the small bodies of the solar system. Mm. And finally, we are also dealing with the fireball, Sp Spanish fireball network that uh, we, were, uh, we have been running for uh, more than 20 years now. So just uh, as an outline of the talk, I will explain, uh, I will go about these ideas that Professor Maynet was presenting this morning. Uh, stars, I will introduce stars as source of chemical elements in the context of the local environment with, in which the solar system was formed. Um, I will talk a little bit about young stars and protoplanetary disks, uh, focusing in our own protoplanetary disk. 
uh, and I will describe a little bit the violent origin of planetesimals, uh, the creation, disruption of building blocks, the gradients of temperature that were at work in the uh, protoplanetary disk that were this was the the first part of the um, uh, chemical segregation of the elements through the disk that were was having a very significant influence on the bodies that were growing from these materials eh, as a as a function of the heliocentric distance then i will go all over the different types of meteorites and their origin eh, as i said uh, i'm going over a very wide overview so I will jump in some uh, parts but um, and of course I will concentrate in the key chondrites that are um, particularly I will describe some chondrite groups and some uh, discussion about their reflectance properties reflectance reflectance capability of these materials eh, to reflect the light of the sun of another star uh, is uh, a key way to understand what is the mineralogy, what is the composition of the asteroids and comets that we are looking usually from very far away. Uh, so it's uh, very important to understand what are the uh, reflectance properties. Then I will go describing a little bit about the components of chondrites and finally Hopefully, I will, I'm able to go over a quick overview of the differentiated meteorites, echondrites, to talk a little bit about the Moon, uh, Vesta, Mars, and other bodies. Well, um, you know, the, the most interesting thing about the origin of the chemical elements, uh, as was uh, previously described, we have this primordial nucleosynthesis that was coming out from the Big Bang. Uh, um, originally all the universe was hydrogen and helium uh, and the rest, this uh, lithium, beryllium and bor were produced by spallation. Uh, so um, at the very beginning um, was uh, not possible to find planets like the Earth or um, beings like ourselves. In, in this context, the astrobiology is the study of life in the universe, just um, concentrated perhaps in three parts, the origins, distribution and evolution of life, structures and processes related to life in the universe, and explicitly the destiny of life. Um, well, in this uh, um, graph, uh, where we have the atomic number in here, we cannot see the, the pointer. Ah, okay. 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 The atomic number, and this is the logarithm in base 10 of the abundance of the elements and so you can see that the hydrogen and helium are the more abundant um, elements at our present time and these are the elements produced in this big bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, I'm, I'm not going in, in full detail about this because it was already explained this morning. So uh, in general after uh, this uh, almost 3,000 millions of years of evolution since the Big Bang, uh, we have the, the, the different galaxies are uh, full of molecular clouds with masses of uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands uh, solar masses and these uh, huge clouds uh, are subjected to gravitational force so locally, uh, as was explained before, are able to um, condense and produce uh, this kind of uh, thing we observe, for example, in the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is a protoplanetary disk edge on, uh, where we can see the visible and the infrared image uh, seen uh, by Hubble. 
where um, here it is some red, but here is clearly the, the protosun uh, just born from the uh, material that has been collapsing. These uh, kind of objects are also typically observed in these uh, environments in which uh, you see a stellar cluster uh, born from the molecular cl the border of this. Uh, this border is also produced by the um, radiation pressure of the stars that are young stars just born from the cloud. So they are producing a, a front uh, that is cleaning the gas all around them. Okay? And um, of course the protostars are having this kind of shapes. You can see, in fact, uh, we cannot see the, the protostar, usually it's too small, but we see yet the jets produced eh, by this uh, bipolar uh, uh, ejection of gas that is falling against the star. Then, um, because of the geometry, um, the, the gas is released in the north and south direction, and this uh, typically uh, observed by also radio telescopes eh, because they are masers eh, that uh, are releasing hydrogen at very high velocity and going through the media. Eh. So this is, uh, these are the, the, the first, uh, you know, uh, um, theoretical approaches describing this kind of uh, bipolar outflows. Um, and these objects are called Herbig Haro objects. In these molecular clouds, it is particularly important that you have the stellar nucleosynthesis. So the molecular clouds are not essentially hydrogen, helium, and few elements more. If not, they contain uh, this pleiade of other elements that uh, in fact are consequence of the chemical evolution of the galaxy, of the stars forming the galaxy. Uh, how many stars have been uh, destroyed or just thrown away uh, through the winds uh, to the interstellar medium have been enriched, having uh, enriched over time the composition of these uh, molecular clouds. In fact, um, we know the, that they are stellar components. Eh? If we study the first uh, materials that we can study by just looking at the interior of the meteorites, we, we see that uh, it, it was a positive contribution of uh, supernovae and red giants to the materials that were at the very beginning in the solar nebula that were just uh, forming the, the first materials. So the evidence for materials from another stars comes mainly from presolar or stellar grains. I don't like the term presolar because it could be contemporary to the solar nebula as well. Um, radioisotopes uh, that can be in the components of these meteorites or tap in the, in the matrix, in the fine-grained materials forming these meteorites. And the isotopic anomalies that are, um, could be from different sources as well. A particular point are the sources of radionuclides. This is a key point. Uh, mm, uh, you see that aluminium 26, um, calcium 41, manganese 53, and iron 60. Um, this is the parent and the daughter that we can find nowadays in, in meteorites. And these are the half life in millions of years. And these are the stellar sources. Uh, usually in the literature has been invoked aluminium 26 and iron 60 from supernovae, hmm? but uh, we uh, were proposing uh, massive or intermediate mass asymptotic giant branch stars 
a source of these uh, key elements. And these are key elements from the point of view that have been considered to be the source of heat, of the primordial heat that was when a, a planetary embryo is formed, is heating the interior and is melting the materials to go away uh, with the chemical uh, segregation, you know, in, in different uh, phases. <coughs> so we propose that, uh, in fact, we realize that uh, 6.5 uh, uh, solar masses AGB star with a solar metallicity could have played an important role in the early uh, solar system. There is obviously uh, evidence, uh, from my point of view, that the, the Sun was not alone when formed, if not probably was in the interior of a stellar association. Um, we think so because some of these uh, radionuclides incorporated a life into these materials. So necessarily you should have a source of these um, you know, uh, uh, life uh, nuclides really close by the solar nebula at the timing that sorted at that, at that time were con condensed to form the solid phases. You know, it's the way in that they incorporate from the vapor phase to condensate to form the first minerals. Okay, so the good thing uh, of the model we, we publish in Meteoritics and Planetary Science is that uh, by comparing the short life nuclides abundances in primitive meteorites, the evidence we have in the literature, with the pattern that we model from a 6.5 uh, solar masses star, um, our model was matching the abundances which is vibrated. The abundances of uh, aluminium 26, uh, calcium 41, iron 60, and palladium 107, eh, that are inferred to be in the, in the solar nebula. What we did is a, a dilution factor of one part of AGB material per 300 parts of original solar nebula material. Eh. So you, with the right mixing, you can get the right uh, ratios for these uh, short life nuclides. Um, at the same time, this model is uh, able not overproduce uh, 53 manganese, né? as supernovae models do, uh, and only marginally affect isotopic ratios of uh, another stable um, elements. It's just uh, one idea that uh, we can really manage uh, to, to have uh, some modeling, astrophysical modeling, try to link the chemical composition of primordial meteorites, chondrites, uh, with the uh, composition that uh, was probably affected by um, nearby stars uh, at the time of formation of our uh, planetary system. Um, as you as you can imagine that um, at the very beginning you have, this will be just a sectional cut of the protoplanetary disk, the star in the center, and then you have, um, this is the mid plane, and as you can imagine there is strong radiation uh, of the order of uh, five, six order of magnitude, current radiation of the sun was the the amount of ultraviolet radiation, for example, of the protosun. Uh, we, we know that by, for the study of another uh, young stars, like T Tauri stars. Uh, so, the, close by the, the protosun, uh, you have a really um, extreme uh, temperatures and very high um, radiation flux. But, um, there is, uh, of course, some silt because of the materials that are in the interior. So in the outer mid-plane, uh, and particularly when you are going 
uh, far away from from the outer exterior you have um, uh, some shielding and then the temperature can be dropping uh, over time um, of course depending of the of the circumstances in which uh, and the time you are studying the different parts and the different uh, locations in here um, you can get different chemistry uh, and of course I will just go over uh, as a consequence of the different distance from the sun you have here the temperature uh, at epoch of the dust settling uh, of the materials the idea is that you have originally a solar gas a star that is collapsing and the star really plays a role because in the, in the moment in that the ignition takes place there is a um, radiation pressure working and cleaning the fog you know cleaning all the gas that is all over these uh, materials and as a consequence the temperature drops abruptly and then um, some of the components of the vapor are condensing into nanometric particles you know the silicates the metal grains are just getting out from all these uh, circumstances, circumstances. Um, this is a model by Del Sem in 2000 in which you see that there is a temperature gradient closer to the sun you have temperatures about 2000 Kelvin and then you can get down at the distance the current distance of Saturn or Jupiter and you have here the condensation of volatile snows um, ices and condensation of organic matter more or less at the outer edge of the um, current main belt but depending on the distance you have less temperature far away and then uh, it allows the condensation of um, phases that are uh, of low temperature okay as a consequence you have the, the formation of the planetesimals, the so-called planetesimals eh? solid rocks in the first part, the inner part of the disk depending on how close is from the sun you have different minerals eh? if they are more close to the sun in more reduced that means in absence of oxygen eh? then in relative absence of oxygen you have more enstatite like uh, silicates and when they are incorporating more oxygen you have more oxidized conditions that will be in this part where the carbonaceous chondrites uh, were formed uh, and then in this outer part of the this you, you have uh, what we call cometesimals that the first blocks forming comets because contain some kind of mixture between fine grain silicates um, let's say one third of each more or less uh, organic matter and uh, ices eh? some mixing of these materials as well mm, this is uh, also the this is the present location any of these uh, planets uh, were formed at that time eh? it's just for your more or, more or less uh, showing the, the positions of the main minerals and you can see here that the olivine uh, pyroxene were formed uh, at, at the location where the terrestrial planets are nowadays iron also uh, toilite, uh, the sulfites in here and water and ammonia, methane were very far away because of the temperature, the condensation temperature are um, much smaller so um, a sectional cut will show you um, in, the, in the outer part of the disk more than 10 astronomical units the formation of probably some subnebula some um, accretion of gas uh, that was um, giving the giant planets together with a 
huge uh, amount of cometesimals that were also participating in the growth of these outer uh, disk uh, bodies. In the inner part, you have this is the snow line, uh, it's the place where the solar radiation is not allowing the ice to be in liquid phase, but uh, the thing is that you have in the more or less the scenario can be um, you know applied to different environments, having into account and how uh, from the point of view of time you know this has been evolved, and of course it depends of the the stellar flux and many other parameters that are evolving on, over time. Uh, it's just a a general overview, of course. So, of course, mm, we should not forget either that all the materials that are um, condensing and are forming these uh, chondritic bodies are also uh, suffering um, the decaying mm, in the protoplanetary disk, so they are going inwards and they can be heated or fragmented over time so they incorporate, um, for example, part of this carbon or oxygen to the vapor phase. Yeah. So this is a highly dynamic system, yeah. it's not a, at all uh, static. Yeah. This has the, the, the feeling that you, you cut that everything should be, but it's not. Yeah. It really, these materials are forming over here and then they are just falling and even some of them are uh, evaporated. You know? In fact, some of the, of, of the models that are explaining the young stars, there is an invoke model that is the falling evaporating bodies. It means that when you observe a young star, you, you can have chance to see absorption lines produced by the materials that are, mm, ag are going against the star. They are falling, there is a continuous disruption of very uh, uh, fragile materials. Eh? Uh, I should say, uh, I'm not explaining it in detail, but we demonstrated uh, using some laboratory uh, studies with Professor Jürgen Blum. Eh? Uh, they, they are, for example, some papers in 2006 in the Astrophysical Journal, where we demonstrate that the first materials, the first uh, building blocks of planet decimals were really having very high porosity. So they were very fragile and then in, in, in those scenarios everything was uh, really weak and fragmenting and uh, recycling all over the solar system. And as you can imagine, and we can stay here for hours, but if you have materials here that are fragile and are colliding with each other and are falling against the protoplanetary disk and reaching the star, you have a lot of uh, recycling of uh, materials that are going to the vapor, vapor phase and going back and so on. And some of these materials that are evaporating because of the high uh, luminosity, the, uh, the radiation pressure, some of them are going back to this outer part of the disk, eh? particularly uh, particles that are less than 10 microns can be perfectly flow up to the location uh, formation of comets. Again, as we demonstrate, I will show you in the Stardust uh, mission to Comet 67P. So, as a brief introduction, uh, the protoplanetary disk uh, cleanup, and these are some of the phases that we go in uh, just as a summary of what I was explaining. In about 10 million of years, you have the evolution of the protoplanetary disk, uh, initially with some gas between these uh, kind of rings form, and then from uh, when the star is, uh, starts to generate so much energy, part of the gas is released to outer space and then you start to, uh, to form these uh, rings with, with the materials that have been condensing from the vapor phase. Mm -hmm. And finally, after 
few tens of millions of years, you have the planetary embryos uh, just uh, surrounding uh, the star. One of the most amazing things of studying carbon ashes chondrites, like for example, Orgale, is that uh, this meteorite that has been heavily, acutely altered, uh, if you compare, this is a logarithmic uh, scale uh, of the CI, uh, the C is from carbon aseous group, and CI is the, from Ibuna, that Orgale belongs to this Ibuna group of carbon aseous chondrites, and you compare the composition of these CIs with the composition of the solar photosphere, you see that there is a really good match for most of the elements. So this rock that uh, some of the people that was able to recover this orgel meteorite was cutting with knives, <laughs> um, is really representative of the composition of the sun itself. Uh, how is that possible? Because it's really uh, challenging from the point of view that most of the meteorites that are arriving the Earth are ordinary chondrites and are rocks and are having some similar composition with the Sun, but not to this much. And the reason for that is that these uh, really fragile, highly porous materials um, contains minerals that have incorporated in their bounds, you know, these volatile phases eh, from which they form. That's the, one of the most amazing things of carbon ashes condites. They can retain um, the, the stellar environment from which they uh, were born. Again, if you look eh, again to this graph and you look at the, the elements that are involved in the formation of living beings, you know, um, there is a, a clear correlation. There they are some elements that are participating, are quite abundant in these uh, materials. And if we look particularly to the elements that are in the Earth's crust, um, it's quite nice to, to compare that. Uh, the rock forming elements are really in some abundances that are very close to the uh, elements that are producing life. Somehow, perhaps this is telling us that the, the, the Earth is a place where the, the elements forming rocks are not so far from the elements that are forming life. So perhaps uh, this kind of um, chemistry can be reproduced all over different places like uh, in, in Earth. In this uh, periodic table, you, you have the abundance represented by different size. Okay? You see that, uh, again, the hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen mm, are dominant. In, in earth crust. So, um, somehow, mm, um, the earth uh, could have uh, the, the conditions uh, in, and the abundances to produce uh, life. In our group, where we are looking for the most primitive uh, chondrites. We are looking for highly unequilibrated chondrites. It means that these meteorites has, haven't been uh, or at least to a big, very big extent, uh, not uh, aqueous alteration, no thermal metamorphism. Um, in such a way, the different components of these chondrites that probably remind you some marbles, okay? This is a thin section and you can see a iron rich, iron oxide rich condyl, iron oxide poor condyl, more olivine, rich, eh? and uh, many other components, fine-grained fragments of contours or calcium aluminium rich inclusions and so on. But these are highly unequilibrated. So in some extent, it's like uh, just taking, you, you know, a, a spoon of the materials that were forming the disk, eh? where 
almost not affected by the compaction or the incorporation of water that was producing in other chondrites, uh, acutely, stream acutely alteration. These are the, the most important classes of carbonaceous chondrites, uh, perdón, excuse me, of uh, chondrites, the ordinary chondrites, the instatite chondrites, the carbonaceous, some anomalous, and in each one of these classes you have the groups, uh, ordinary, instatite, carbonaceous, and anomalous. Um, each one of these groups have a specific uh, elemental uh, chemistry uh, that is uh, able to distinguish from each other. Um, in some groups, these are called uh, petrologic types. And the most pristine meteorites that have not suffered to a very deep extent uh, thermal metamorphism, neither aqueous alteration, will be the petrologic type 3. So if you hear about um, Axfer 094 or um, Alan Hill 77307, you will see that, uh, for example, this Alan Hill 77307 is a very pristine meteorite from the CO. Um, the O comes from Ornans. And this has the perturbatic type 3. That means that it's pristine. Just in, in a very simple way. Those meteorites that have suffered aqueous alteration can go to petrology type 2, or if the aqueous alteration is extreme, petrology type 1. Okay? And if in case of thermal metamorphism, that could mean that uh, these materials have been cooked in the interior of a larger object, larger asteroid, for example, these are going to petrology type 4, 5, 6, and that most of the ordinary chondrites are having these uh, 4, 5, 6 um, petrology types. That it means, in a very simplistic way, that they are probably uh, formed at different depths in their parent asteroids. Okay? Well, the main minerals in chondrites, um, the main rock forming minerals, um, you see that in the chondrites we observe the, the chondrules, the calcium aluminium rich inclusions, metal grains, and fine dust components. Uh, for the silicates, you can find the olivine, or in particular, the primordial olivine is magnesium hmm? um, rich um, olivine. And the, this uh, iron rich, uh, the incorporation of iron depends also of the degree of um, heating of the material in the protoplanetary disk and in the interior of these bodies afterwards. Then you have um, the pyroxene and other uh, minerals like enstatite that is more common in the inner part of the disk because. Uh, it has not uh, so much uh, oxygen uh, in the structure. And then you have plagioclase and sulfides like toilite or pyrrhotite as well. If we observe these materials using X ray mappings uh, and you give to the magnesium a red, to the calcium green, and aluminium blue color, then you end with this kind of images, where you can see here a magnesium-rich condyl or fragment of a condyl, a violet calcium aluminum rich inclusion, because it's a mixture of it with calcium aluminum, green plus blue, okay? And you can see this kind of uh, beautiful things, this is about uh, uh, 200 microns, uh, and this is about one square millimeter. And you hear these uh, emeboid olivine inclusions, and the kind of uh, aggregates. And these are uh, observed in Asfer 094, that is one of the meteorites I have been uh, working in. Um, 
as this is a highly unequilibrated meteorite, all these phases are uh, out of equilibrium with the matrix uh, surrounding the materials. So they are representative of the materials uh, at the very beginning uh, from which uh, they, these bodies were formed. The condols, some of the condols are rich in iron. In this backscatter, this microscope images, you can see when they contain more iron, they are brighter than when they lack of iron, but the iron could be uh, as, a, as metal grains. So here we have a high FeO type condol and low FeO type uh, condol. At the same time, we have, fortunately, some quite pristine ordinary chondrites. So we can go even over the first step in the formation of condors. And this kind of images uh, can show you that a very, very big condor is formed by uh, an aggregate where you can see uh, magnesium-rich uh, pieces, you know, um, because was not able uh, to complete the chemical equilibration of the melt, you know? So this is telling us that in general, condols are produced by heating of fine grain materials, you know? Uh, you have these uh, magnesium rich silicates condensing from the, from the vapor phase at really small sizes and then forming comets. These tiny things mixture with organics and ices doing things. But when they went inwards, the protoplanetary disk, they were forming aggregates, these IDPs things, that when they just got hit or uh, heated by the irradiation, were melt. And a state in melting state for hours or days in the nebula, perhaps also incorporating some materials at that, at that point, you know, and when the time pass, uh, this solidified forming condors. And the term chondrite comes from condors that are the most abundant components of most uh, of the chondrites. Okay, some chondrites, a lack of condors, but that's another, another issue. But in general, the term chondrite comes from this. So this is the evidence that the really tiny minerals that were forming were processed in the protoplanetary disk. So were melt, were producing um, from micron size to millimeter or centimeter scale uh, components, not only um, condors, you can have even more extreme processing that should be the calcium aluminum rich inclusions. These ones. You see here in Asphere 094, that is quite amazing. I shouldn't go far away than that. <laughs> um, you see here that this kind of aggregate is following the same magnesium, calcium, aluminum path than I previously explained. So this is calcium, aluminum uh, rich uh, particle. And you can see here kind of aggregate in the nearby the uh, particle. What this means? That this was an aggregate. And this aggregate was going inwards and was unfortunately for him going too close to the sun where all the volatile silicates, or not all, but a significant part, just vaporize. What remain? Oxides, calcium aluminum oxides. You know, that's a, a very important picture of what was going on. You have different uh, stages of heating, of processing, thermal processing in the protoplanetary disk. How we know it? by studying the components of some of these uh, really uh, amazing, uh, really preserved uh, chondrites. And the amazing thing in this uh, 
these are some of the most uh, common minerals, espinel, melilite, hibonite, uh, just for your general knowledge. Um, but these calcium and aluminum inclusions also retain a variety of isotopic anomalies uh, in oxygen 16, aluminum 26, manganese 53, calcium 41, rubidium 87, that probably were inherited from incompletely homogenized materials. And this could have some idea that the environment in which these materials were formed was probably subjected to the incorporation of materials from nearby stars. You know, because in any of these, uh, some of these meteorites have very specific formation times and are not identical. So perhaps in the future, if we are able to get more of these really um, pristine meteorites, we can go into the details uh, uh, how the abundances of these live nucleides were changing over time. It's a very fascinating possibility. When we compare, on the other hand, the composition, this is the abundance compared with the sea ice. Eh? If all, the, all these groups, ordinary chondrites, CB chondrites, and CM chondrites, eh? M from Miguel, B from Bigarano, that are the first meteorites of this class, of this group, excuse me. So if everything was comparable with the solar, solar is a little bit out, the CI, eh, the composition of the Ibuna group of carbonaceous chondrites, then all this should be in this line. But the thing is not. Each of these groups have, as you can see here, a, a different pattern, a different slope. Uh, some is not so like a, a style line, of course, but uh, you observe clearly uh, differences. So it means that the materials forming the different chondrite groups suffer different uh, degrees of uh, thermal processing. Okay, so it seems that much. It seems that all these models about protoplanetary disks that were proposing formation of rings that some of these groups perhaps are representative of different distance to the sun? Well, we are observing these kind of things. We are observing that in other stars, like for example, HL Tauri, just using the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA, we observe this uh, kind of gradational, uh, gradational um, differences. So we expect that the, the composition of each one of these things should be different somehow. Uh, and is uh, really what we, uh, we are uh, observing. But yes, we have this uh, amount of uh, new data about meteorites, but there is a big challenge. We need to really understand each one of these meteorites from which body is coming. Um, the chondrites represent a dominant part of the main belt population, yeah? um, particularly the smaller bodies, but still our collections of meteorites are highly biased. At the present time we are receiving um, meteorite groups um, that probably uh, are not all uh, the, comp the compositions that are uh, likely in the in the main belt, for example. At the same time, we have also large bodies. I will discuss in the echondritic part, but uh, we have really uh, a challenge uh, uh, puzzle in the sense that uh, we know, afterwards, we made this uh, modeling and um, how the uh, these asteroids have been. Uh, affected by collisions over time and how they are compacted is what uh, we were modeling 
in this uh, astrophysical journal paper. Um, and uh, what we conclude is that most of these uh, chondritic asteroids have suffered a huge uh, collision rates uh, to the extent that most of these bodies probably were suffering really uh, huge impacts that were destroying, in many cases, uh, just able to disrupt the asteroids. Or if it's not the case, you have really a regolith, just collisional process material with a depth of uh, kilometers. So you are not observing uh, really the, the body, if not just the amount of process material that is over the top of this uh, regolithic uh, material. It's not surprising because also we know that in the moon we have regions covered by mega regolith. Huge blocks produced by these collisions over the ions. These uh, processes are called impact gardening. Uh, this gardening, uh, in which you have the ejecta that is excavated by the impact, is coming back in some cases to the surface and then is uh, covering the surface over time and, uh, of course, uh, affecting the uh, reflective conditions. At the same time, you have huge impacts or huge impactors, but you have also a small meteorite projectiles plus uh, a really uh, radiative uh, um, energetic radiation going through the surface of the bodies, and this is also producing producing this uh, comminution. So over time you have that the materials on the surface are affected by this micrometeoritic uh, bombardment and also the solar wind and cosmic rays are affecting the, the surfaces and this is really uh, producing uh, that the, the material is being fragmented over time to size very small so this is uh, the comminution uh, process that is observed, for example, in, in lunar regolith. When we look, for example, to space missions like uh, Eros or uh, Hayabusa, uh, Eros asteroid um, and Itokawa asteroid, you see that uh, really the, the surface of these bodies are covered by uh, boulders, big uh, blocks or um, small pebbles, or even uh, just a micrometer size uh, dust that are incorporated uh, over the, the, the asteroid over time. And as you can imagine, this is really hidden what is in depth. It's really challenging because over time these bodies could have been in a region where have suffered thousands, millions of impacts and then ha have been covering the surface of materials that are not necessarily the composition of these asteroids. So it's kind of mixing, you know, and that's why it's a challenge and we need to uh, program um, the exploration of other bodies. This uh, slide is a very beautiful slide from Francesca De Meo, it's a, a PhD thesis, uh, in which you see as a function of the heliocentric distance uh, and the present location of the planets, you see that this is the, the, the reflectant spectra from 0.4 microns up to about uh, 1 micron, Okay, and you see how different are the materials depending on the different reflectance classes. So, just for not uh, getting you lost, uh, each, um, let's say, um, the, the asteroids that are reflecting in a very similar way the light of the sun are identified as a class. Okay, the V class is a type of um, 
asteroids, you know, that is related with one, cl um, one class of, of meteorites that is associated with Vesta and have uh, a specific absorption bands uh, that are characteristic of differentiated meteorites. Um, ordinary chondrites that are similar uh, are similar to these S-class asteroids. You know? So you can have some idea of how this uh, behaves. Uh, we are just matching asteroids by the similar reflectance. We have not chemical uh, information other than the reflectance of light. Uh, and then we make these matches. Of course, when you go out, you see um, these almost flat behaviors. And we, when we are jumping to the trans-Neptunian region, you start to see methane, water uh, bands that are a consequence of a less processed um, surfaces. Okay, so uh, in the case of the ordinary chondrites, we can see here um, that can be distributed. This is the, the weight percent of iron oxide and the weight percent of iron in form of metal grains plus troilite. You see? And you see that uh, they are specific groups. The H chondrites, that uh, means height in metal and troilite, in reduced form. The L chondrites that are more oxidized and the LL chondrites that are uh, in this part. In here you will have the carbonaceous chondrites. I will explain later. This is the spectral reflectance characteristic uh, spectrum huh? for uh, asteroid Eros, for example. Okay? Well, you can see the, the olivine and pyroxene uh, sometimes bands uh, that are characteristics uh, of this. Uh, the plausible origin that has been proposed at least of the L group is the Jephion asteroid family that was born during a catastrophic collision about 485 million of years ago. This family is also next to the Phi 2 resonance, that is the way as the, the fragments of these collisions could reach the Earth, and just uh, by gravitational perturbations. Uh, you can see in here the semi-major axis. Uh, each one of these points are asteroids. Okay, this is the inclination, and this is the Jephion family, in in detail here magnified. These uh, different red pieces are parts of the progenitor. You know, Jephion was bigger, but was suffering a very huge collision and fragmented in many pieces, and each one of these pieces. Uh, is uh, having very similar reflectance aspect. Not necessarily identical, but quite similar. Uh, in here you can see, for example, the location of Ceres as well. Uh, this is from in this, in this specific part. This is eccentricity and this is in inclination. And here is the, again the same family, the Jephion family that is more or less in the middle of this distribution. Well, by doing what the uh, Japanese uh, space agency was doing on Hayabusa, we really learned how these uh, objects were formed. And as you can imagine, this asteroid is a nice example of what we call a rubble pile, a body that was initially having perhaps tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers in size, but that was just uh, impacted by a, a body probably in the same size or a little less than that. And then as a consequence of the, this uh, huge collision was scattered into pieces and some of them were going back to form 
the present asteroid, you know? Um, Itokawa is covered by fine-grained regolith rocks and boulders that are the product of this collisional gardening and are also have suffered space weathering, aging by uh, cosmic irradiation, solar wind, uh, and the mineralogy is associated with the chondrites, we, we ordinary chondrites from the group LL, low metal, low ACO. Okay, if we compare the composition of the ordinary chondrites, you see here the different groups, and Itokawa, this is the fascia head and fire light composition in modal percent, you see here that Itokawa is here, so it's clearly in the LL group, you know. This doesn't mean necessarily that the LL chondrites are coming from Itokawa, because it can be the, the in fact, uh, that uh, you have a specific uh, bodies that are having similar composition, but as you can see here, um, these highly uh, equilibrated uh, Itokawa particles are in this part that are matching very well uh, the uh, phyalytic uh, composition uh, of the silicates. We have been working in our um, laboratory at the Institute of Space Sciences of some of these regolith particles. Uh, you can see here one of them that is uh, about uh, 100 microns in the long axis um, uh, and we, we have been studying in particular the mechanical and the magnetic properties uh, and this is a hopefully will be soon a forthcoming uh, paper. The interesting thing that, that this particle has been on the surface of the asteroid Itokawa for thousands of millions of years and have been affected by collisions by these um, space weathering uh, processes, uh, but the, the properties, the mechanical and magnetic properties are not very different from the chondrites that have been less exposed to the interstellar or interplanetary space. This is from Osaka University, some kind of a result uh, of all this um, Hayabusa mission in which uh, you have the, the evolution, you have a parent body of Itokawa larger than about 20 kilometers in size that uh, was suffering this cataclysmic disruption, then the fragments were reaccumulated and this was happening about uh, 1.4 giga years ago and then was some resurfacing so mostly eight million years ago, um, then uh, going this body to a new secular resonance with Saturn that was bringing the body to the current orbit in which this was uh, studied by Hayabusa uh, and mission. This uh, kind of body finally uh, could have uh, ending the, the days just uh, colliding with uh, with the Earth or the terrestrial planets. So it's quite uh, interesting to to study uh, this kind of materials. And as you know, we also had uh, impacts, very recent ones, like Chelyabinsk. We have been also studying Chelyabinsk. Particularly, we are very interested in the high pressure uh, phases that are produced by uh, impact. Um, some of the, the materials that are um, on the surface of the asteroid when just is uh, getting so high energy and the shock waves that are crossing the material is just affecting uh, completely um, some um, in the sense that is also contributing to thermal, uh, some thermal metamorphins produced by shock. Uh, and this is uh, also affecting the, uh, the meteorite, the, they are producing melts all over the meteorite, uh, 
cracks that are filled by the vapors during uh, microseconds, you know, and are forming these kind of structures that you can see in here. Some structures, some um, fractures filled with uh, shock uh, induced uh, minerals that we can study using uh, Raman spectrometers, is what we have been doing, for example. Uh, in here you see that uh, the olivine is transformed into merylite. Yeah? It's a high uh, pressure uh, polymorph of uh, olivine. And in case, uh, for example, you have also the incorporation as phosphorus is going easily from uh, plagioclase or other components of the meteorite to the vapor phase in the interior of the meteorite because of the stress of the shock wave going through then uh, you have the formation of this um, polymorph of merylite uh, uh, that is uh, having this trigonal structure uh, in, in shock veins. Um, we can characterize these materials using uh, these Raman spectrometers and also um, we are having uh, the ALBA synchrotron really close our installation so uh, we can also use uh, these is infractures. Okay, well, perhaps this is too dark, but so well. Basically, here you have the this axis is the heliocentric distance. This is five astronomical units. This is two astronomical units, and this is the percent of total population. And you see here the E, S, C, P, D. Uh, these are uh, spectral classes of, uh, of asteroids. And you see that the enstatite population is mostly in the inner part of the main belt. This is the, the location of the main belt. Here you have the S class of ordinary chondrite like uh, asteroids, the C from carbonaceous, P from carbonaceous chondrites so, as well and the D that is more uh, some kind of pristine population perhaps more transitional with comets between asteroids and comets and something like that. Um, as you can see most of the of the really processed materials uh, enstatite rich materials or ordinary chondrites are in the inner part and most of the asteroids that are less processed are in the outer part of the uh, main belt, eh? nowadays. So it's what we were expecting from this uh, uh, modeling. Um, in case of um, carbonaceous chondrite, we have this uh, Matilde, uh, this kind of reflectance spectra with a uh, few absorption bands. Sometimes you have clear absorption bands, for example, from uh, water, uh, phyllosilicates, uh, uh, another uh, um, and oxides and carbonates, uh, but in general um, they lack of uh, very deep uh, features, except uh, perhaps uh, water bonds and so on. The, as I said, the carbonaceous chondrites, uh, the, one of the most important things that they were able, in some cases, some groups contain until 10% in water and 4% uh, carbon in mass. So they are rocks, but they are just retaining part of the volatiles from which they form. Uh, it's one of the most uh, fascinating things of carbonaceous condites. And this is because part of this water was bonded in the minerals themselves. You know, you have water as uh, phyllosilicates, from the silicates were transforming in phyllosilicates, from the um, iron phases were oxidized to produce hematite and other minerals, you know, that were uh, born from in the interiors with the presence of, of water. And we can uh, study uh, all these uh, things. We use uh, these uh, spectrometers uh, in order just to deal with the uh, behaviors. And you have here this for part of a Molly Notices uh, paper we published concerning uh, from the ultraviolet to um, the near infrared, uh, what was the behavior of some 
different groups of carbonaceous chondrites. Um, we try to uh, really uh, use this uh, data in order to um, understand uh, if uh, depending on the albedo or the different slopes and features that we observe, small features, uh, we can um, help to, to characterize uh, primitive uh, carbonaceous uh, asteroids. But one of the most interesting things in, in which we are now working is the aqueous alteration. And we, we have been working uh, particularly on the, on the models that try to explain the, um, the alteration of the parent asteroid of the CM carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, I will you give you some, some details in the next slides. And we have been now working in the new group, well, it's not new, but uh, it's, we start to, dis to discover more in Antarctica of these CRs. Uh, that is extremely interesting because some of them are very pristine uh, and contain clues of how water was incorporated into these materials. In the CM group, you have uh, clear features from one meteorite to other meteorite from the same group that some of these meteorites were coming from different depths in the parent asteroid because you have a uh, different degrees of aqueous alteration for meteorites that are having similar composition and then they are probably forming from a, a similar object. Um, when we look at the for example, the famous Murchison meteorite, we deal with a very interesting observations. For example, you have this condyl that is an iron rich, as you can see here, olivine form uh, condyl with the metal grains in the interior. And then you see here is the, the fine grain materials that are surrounding the condyl. But if you look in detail to here, you see that this metal grain that was just in the border of the condyl has been corroded by water. And part of this corrosion is going inside the condyl, as you can see here. This uh, four pumps of our review paper we have just uh, published in the Space Science Reviews uh, this year, just one month ago. Um, in which we also observe the nature of this matrix in the meteorite. We were going deep to nanometric scale using a very high resolution transmission electron microscope that is uh, Granada University in Andalusia, where you can see here this is 200 nanometers scale and you can see here some funny elephant <laughs> that is produced by phyllosilicates. These are different, uh, you can see identified um, the different boxes that are in here. Probably you can see at this uh, with this screen, but uh, you can you will see in the PDF. These are the different uh, minerals identified uh, using this uh, transmission electron microscope. Um, the interesting thing of this image, when you compare with the X-ray mappings for each element, is uh, this sulfur, you know, and um, iron. So you see that they are uh, faces really close by a phyllosilicate that are highly reactive. So in our opinion, if uh, these uh, phyllosilicates are produced by interaction with water, uh, then uh, these highly reactive uh, minerals shouldn't be here. So we particularly think we, that observation at nanoscale of the matrix of some of these carbonaceous chondrites could be very important to uh, demonstrate if uh, wet accretion 
was taking place. Wet accretion means that incorporation from the protoplanetary dish of hydrated minerals into the structure of these asteroids. In some cases, for example, this uh, amazing meteorite, we observe these uh, structures that if you go in detail, <laughs> is uh, really amazing the degree of aqueous alteration in which you have the, the pyrrhotite gone. This hole was pyrrhotite, but under the, the, the effect of water was transform, transforming in these uh, magnetic clusters, eh? Eh? magnetite. And of, of course also formation of carbonates uh, sometimes. And we have also discovered that we'll be getting out soon in, in nature astronomy the first piece of a comet or an object at least that we have not in our meteorite collections. And this is uh, the small cluster you have here, okay, that we have been studying in my PhD student that one year ago was doctorated uh, cum laude. Um, Carles Moyano was uh, just studying in Carnegie Institution in Washington, uh, just in order to study the different chemistry that is um, hosting this cluster. Um, the amazing thing of this is that you have a carbon-rich class <coughs> different from the matrix of the meteorite in terms of the carbon abundance. It has mostly normal hydrogen and nitrogen isotopes, but higher presolar grain abundances and what is called glass with embedded metal and sulfites. That this is a typical feature of material that have been uh, subjected to uh, cosmic uh, radiation no? in the outer space. So we propose that this is a sample, perhaps, of a, a fragment, a small fragment of a, a body, and will be a, a forthcoming uh, paper soon. Uh, the amazing thing as well is that we think is also evidence for uh, accretion, wet accretion, in the sense that we see in the border of the clust that is uh, also enriched in uh, oxygen uh, 16. So it's, it's kind of a really beautiful evidence we have just uh, discovered in, in Barcelona. So I'm, I'm very glad about this uh, discovery as well. We have, we have also discovered uh, at UCLA the first flow of uh, water water dilution in a carbonaceous chondrite um, in this MET 01070 uh, that has also extensive aqueous alteration and is producing this kind of lenses uh, probably um, indicating that there is some kind of uh, thermal gradient able to um, make the, the water moving through the body uh, at least up to uh, the point in which uh, no more energy is, is uh, able no, to... Uh, when this um, process stacks, then particular aqueously alteration minerals are precipitating from the uh, aqueous fluid, okay? And they are producing uh, this kind of um, lens uh, features we are observing here. It has uh, also very you can see here phosphorus, nickel, sulfur, also very interesting elements from the point of view of uh, origin of life. And one of the big issues about the origin of life uh, are also related with the origin of phosphorus. Uh, just uh, keep this in mind, because we have also interesting results uh, coming soon, hopefully, uh, on, this, on this issue. Um, and I want to particularly focus, because I think it's absolutely relevant, uh, the importance of aqueous alteration in um, these asteroids. There is isotopic dating of the carbonates, 
This uh, was made first, to my knowledge, by uh, teams of Japanese co colleagues are really good with uh, tiny things and then they were uh, able to get uh, carbonates dating in some of these carbonaceous chondrites. And they realized that these carbonates were produced during the first 10 millions of years of the history of the parent asteroid. This means that these asteroids were soaked in water many tens of millions of years before of the formation of the Earth. And this means that most of these soluble organics that are discovered in Murchison or in this uh, fascinating meteorite that has an order of magnitude higher abundance in amino acids than Murchison, all these were produced by interaction of water with the minerals. And in fact, this was the point that was promoting us to make some laboratory experiments. And here is described the, the procedure, but of course you can, you can go um, to the paper in detail. And we, we were analyzing the catalytic effect of cis carbonaceous chondrites that we pick up quite randomly from the NASA Antarctic uh, collection. Um, they were just uh, sent from the Johnson Space Center to the Institute of Space Sciences. We just ground 50 milligrams of the stone in uh, agate mortar and then we brought the samples uh, to, to Italy, where uh, the, the team of uh, Professor Rafael Saladino uh, was doing some, uh, some uh, of these experiments, in which, uh, you see, we, we have different scenarios with thermal water and seawater uh, uh, in presence of the carbonaceous chondrite powders, uh, and without, as a blank, you know, um, this is the way in, in which the, the organics were analyzed. Um, and to identify the structure of the products, two strategies were followed uh, using the spectra compared with commercially available electron mass uh, libraries. And uh, this uh, analysis by uh, mass spectrometry uh, with uh, standard compounds. And what we found? We found that in presence of formamide with hot water and the meteorite powders, no other thing, you can generate almost everything in uh, the prebiotic, you know, uh, scenario. All these uh, amino acids, uh, nucleobases, uh, analogs, um, miscellanea. Um, so, these are the experimental conditions. 1% of the meteorite, 59% of formamide, 40% of water, the temperature was 140 degrees Celsius, 24 hours. And we got all this. <laughs> so, um, of course, this has changed completely our minds. Uh, initially, I was thinking, okay, uh, this should be produced at some point in the parent asteroids um, because in the right conditions they reach the Earth and they were just uh, providing a very good uh, setting, you know, to, to promote uh, chemical complexity. Well, the thing is that we have evidence of this uh, late heavy bombardment, the, this change this cataclysmic event that was going all over the solar system. We know uh, that the migration of giant planets are not exclusive of the solar system. We are observing also in other planetary systems. So, um, uh, is uh, a clear example that all these materials form in the in the other part of the protoplanetary of the main belt. Eh? Um, the main belt uh, in the past probably was 100 times 
or 1,000 times um, more populated than nowadays. And most of these bodies that were condensing and were aggregating in there were scattered gravitationally because of the migration of Jupiter and Saturn. At 3.8, 3.9 million years ago, these were falling against the Earth-Moon system, as we have from the lunar rocks, all this dating of the big basins and big craters on the Moon. Uh, and at the same time, for sure, these were scattered all over the solar system. And of course, if you have Jupiter and Saturn being the main, you know, <laughs> Uh, bodies promoting all this cataclysm, then you have these planetary bodies, the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn, that perhaps have uh, also um, uh, received part of these materials. I will go over this uh, later. But I think uh, the most amazing thing of these experiments is that we have demonstrated that the minerals forming carbonaceous chondrites have catalytic properties that we don't know in any other rock, neither in Earth, Mars, Vesta or whatever. And we need to keep exploring this in order to see if uh, this is a really a good scenario to understand the increasing of chemical complexity. We are very far away from now about the origin of life. But a first step to make uh, the ap appearance of life likely than we expected. I want also to focus in another important thing, I th in my opinion. You probably know about the enantiomeric excesses. Eh? Some organic molecules exhibit chiral structures. The uh, uh, right and left um, hands. Eh? Um, you know that an antiomer is one of two stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other. Okay? And in Earth, only the left forms, the Leboyer forms, are viable for proteins and enzymes. Well, uh, Cronin and Pisarello were found, uh, found that the murchison and other carbonaceous chondrites have enantiomeric excesses in amino acids similar to terrestrial. What is this saying? Well, this is saying that somehow this happened, we have no idea how this happened. Uh, in nature, in, in the Earth, we have the, the L forms for proteins and enzymes are dominating. The to my knowledge, but perhaps Muriel can give me many other light. Uh, in, in, but in, uh, to my knowledge, um, the uh, likely way to do that is that you originally, in a natural way, you have, if this carbonaceous chondrite were playing a role and, let's say, um, bringing these materials to the surface of the Earth, and the, the minerals, in case that more of these organics were not able to, you know, were destroyed during vaporization and so on. We, we have, on the other hand, laboratory studies that say that it's not complete and the vaporization of these materials. But in any case, just in case that the minerals arrive there and they have some rule in producing uh, complexity, um, these left uh, forms probably are inherited of the carbonaceous materials uh, that were forming these uh, asteroids. It's interesting, somehow. Uh, of course, if, if we are looking to the um, oxygen isotopes, this was a very famous work by Donald Clayton, 1973 where they develop this delta-18 oxygen, which you can apply to any of these isotopes, but here we compare the, the ratio uh, of um, oxygen-18-16 from the sample to the oxygen-18-16 of the standard mean 
ocean water. We can compare um, this ratio with the water on the ocean, okay, of the earth. We, this is uh, less one, and this is multiplied by factor of 1,000, okay? And if we plot this in here for delta oxygen 18 and delta oxygen 17, we see that there is a line in which all terrestrial rocks are, more or less, could be some scattering, is the terrestrial fractionation line. And look at that, we have the enstatic chondrites in here. And in here we have the ordinary chondrites of the high FeO, you know, rich in iron or low in iron. And we have here the sea ice, Ibuna-like group of carbonaceous chondrites. And these are aligned. On the other hand, we have the COs, carbonaceous chondrites, CKs, CVs. Eh? This is the, um, the line of anhydrous carbonaceous chondrites that is quite different in the slope from the terrestrial fractionation line. What is this meaning? Well, this is meaning from the point of view of the view of the right mixture, and we were just talking before. Uh, probably most of the materials forming the earth were, um, were uh, from bodies that were having this type of composition. Of course, it was a big mixture, so for sure some carbonaceous materials also reached the earth and were forming, but the dominant part of the earth was uh, mostly by this type of uh, ordinary uh, chondrites. On the other hand, we also, when we compare with other observations, this is, these are the osmium uh, 187, 188 ratio, and you compare the carbonaceous ordinary and instatite, you see that the primitive upper mantle of the earth is releasing, you know, this osmium in uh, some values that are similar to the ordinary chondrites. Uh, so this is also bidding for a significant contribution of these ordinary chondrites to the mixture. So in order just to fix some ideas, let's see how is formed Comet Will 2. And this has been achieved thanks that in the Estardats mission uh, from which uh, some of us uh, were participating in the preliminary examination team, uh, were able to collect, this is the aerogel, silicon dioxide aerogel, in, in few millimeters, the particles penetrating in here, this is the top of the aerogel, this is a cut, sectional cut, you see that they are um, bulbs just uh, created by the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the vapor, phase in which part of the materials are vaporized at the penetrating, part of the wall are covered by these uh, um, fine grain materials, but at the end you have these tiny things that are mineral grains in a comet uh, uh, will shoot. The, the amazing thing of the aerogel, this technique, is that uh, the sample collector was exposed uh, during some time uh, with particles that were released from the comet uh, uh, and just were, were uh, colliding with the aerogel uh, with the, also the aluminum foil that was used to um, fix the, the, the aerogel itself. Um, well, these particles, what are the composition of these particles? This is a, just an example, I cannot go in, in full detail of course this will require many of these talks, but the largest recovered grains are having diameters between 5 and, and 15 microns. Um, the toughest uh, fragments um, you see uh, were captured, uh, are main, mainly made by olivine and pyroxene, uh, and in some cases you have these ending particles, 
And this is a nice example. This is the Febo particle um, that we were studying, and particularly that Gabriela Matag was studying with the high resolution transmission electron microscopy, was studying this part in here. The funny thing of this particle is just you have the, this uh, troilite mineral grain that was in front of the particle, so they, it was shielding the fine grain materials that were behind. It preserved of this material of become fragmented and just going through the walls very quickly. Okay? You have also an uh, instatite grain in here, so instatite is also forming comets. <laughs> and the amazing thing of this is that this is fine grain solar composition material. That when you look in particular to this area, you find in here a nitrogen 15 hotspot as you expect to have in materials that are coming from interstellar space. So the amazing thing of this particle is that you have uh, minerals formed at high temperature, so in the interior of the protoplanetary disk, together with materials that were condensing in the outer space. So uh, comets are a mixture of uh, you know, fine-grained materials coming from many places uh, in the uh, protoplanetary disk. If we look also to the deuterium ratios, many times, uh, well, you know, in the, in the news you can hear everything. Well, it's clearly demonstrated that the water in the ocean is not coming from comets, because some guys have been observing that most of these, you know, highly eccentric comets are not having deuterium um, hydrogen ratios and blah, blah, blah. But don't forget, we are missing part of the movie. We are missing the movie in which you have transitional bodies in the other part of the main belt, like Harley 2, Will 2, okay, that are having similar deuterium hydrogen ratios. So perhaps the bodies that were bringing most of the water of the Earth are not so common at current time, but were part of the bodies that were, you know, scattered all over the solar system at the time that happened, probably, the migration of the Jupiter and Saturn, eh? the giant planets. So this has uh, very deep implications, of course, on the future of many of these bodies. And I am afraid that I will go a little bit fast not. But of course you can imagine that uh, um, we have now some idea of the origin of water, of the origin of uh, deuterium, um, these kind of things. Um, and I want to go quite quickly about echondrites. The, the word echondrite means that has no condors. Eh? The materials have been, they are igneous meteorites. Eh? They are um, segregated from the primordial materials, from the chondritic materials, were melt and were some secondary um, uh, minerals produced by the uh, igneous uh, processing of the, their parent big asteroids or even planetary bodies. A clear example is uh, Vesta. I brought with me a thin section of this meteorite, Puerto Lapice, that we recover in uh, Ciudad Real in, in Spain, 2007. It's a piece of uh, uh, asteroid Vesta. And then, uh, or some of the pieces that are scattered in the solar system from this asteroid, because I will explain you later. <laughs> and you have also the echondrites diversity. The primitive uh, echondrites like Acalpucoite, this one, uh, Lodranites, Winonites, the asteroidal echondrites, there are many types in here. Uh, in, in, in between you have the basaltic asteroidal echondrites that are the Howardites 
eukaryotes and diogenites, the H E D echondrites that are coming likely from Vesta. And when we have also lunar echondrites and Martian echondrites that are known by the three meteorite types, Sergotites from Sergoti, Naclites from Nacla, Chassinite from Chassigny. Well, um, of course, as these are igneous uh, meteorites that are produced from chondrites uh, um, thermal processing, you can have uh, different compositions and a big variety of, of bodies. Uh, some of these uh, meteorites I'm showing you form part of our meteorite collection at the Institute of Space Sciences. Um, this is a very beautiful, uh, you know, see, some regolite clearly with different clusters of different lithologies. Uh, this is a famous Peña Blanca Springs uh, Obright fall. Uh, and in general, you, you can find that some of these uh, echondrites um, are coming from many bodies in the solar system that we still have not explored. So in general, we have no clear idea uh, what are the progenitors. Um, fortunately, we have uh, falls like Almahatasita, that was, I remember you, that this was the first fall of a um, near-Earth asteroid um, discovered 20 hours before impacting the desert of Nubia in Sudan, you know, uh, in 2008. Um, this was studied by uh, Peter Jeniskens eh, from NASA Ames. Um, a very amazing discovery is that this was a, a complex mixing of different um, types of materials, even some kind of new unknown materials, chondritic materials, and were collected all over uh, the desert of uh, Nubia. And then, uh, as you can imagine, provide a lot of information about uh, different bodies in the, in the solar system. Many of these uh, meter-sized bodies that are uh, going through the Earth space can be also um, produced by different uh, lithologies and are consequence of continuous collision between bodies uh, or they can be coming from the surface of bodies that have been um, um, affected by, by impacts over time. Then we have the Howardite Eucrite Diogenites from, from Vesta, um, but still they are an, another basaltic uh, meteorites that are exactly not the composition of Vesta or the Vestoids, that are the fragments uh, of Vesta, like for example Maginia, that is another type of basaltic body. And of course, the, the new missions are able to go in full details to, to explore the structures, the surface of these bodies and learn uh, many things uh, on that. Then we have the lunar echondrites uh, and of course the lunar rocks, more than 400 kilograms or almost 400 kilograms uh, of uh, lunar rocks brought by the Apollo uh, astronauts to, our, to Earth that allow us to um, um, you know, add real science uh, dating of the surface um, of the Moon that can be added to all these uh, crater counting measurements about the ages of some of the um, lunar surfaces. We are also studying in our institute um, the reflectance properties of some of these lunar meteorites. This is uh, one, one example in which we compare um, the, uh, in here, this is a Howardite from Vesta, um, this is Puerto Lapiz Eucrite from Vesta as well, and this is a, a, a lunar where you can see here, uh, the elbow in here is deeper, that is a consequence of this um, fine grain um, regolith that is forming this uh, lunar 
uh, breccia. We are also uh, studying uh, Mars, particularly studying uh, Martian meteorites, the sergotite, naclite, and chassinite echondrites. We know so far 227 Martian meteorites, and they can be distinguished by the aluminum silicon magnesium silicon ratios that are distinctive of the Martian meteorites compared with the Earth ones. Okay, and uh, the, the, the demonstration that these meteorites uh, are from Mars, as you can understand, was long debated, but uh, came from the study of the trap atmosphere in one sergotite. In the sergotite glass is trapped the uh, abundance of the main um, components of Martian atmosphere. This uh, was an important result by Bogart and Johnson in 1983, and from them is uh, clearly demonstrated that these echondrites are coming from Mars. Meteorites that were formed at different times when Mars was absolutely different to our present time. This is a, a work by a colleague of the Centro de Astrobiología in Madrid, uh, Fernández Remolar, in which uh, they were just proposing a very different climatic environment in which uh, liquid water was present on this uh, surface of Mars. On the other hand, from images from Mars Global Surveyor, for example, we have all this evidence for floods uh, and even formation of uh, river structures in, in the surface of Mars. So, uh, water was at uh, different times uh, quite uh, abundant in the uh, surface of water, in, uh, in the surface of Mars. And even nowadays, the new exposed craters, uh, by quite recent impacts, are exposing the permafrost, inner layers, that is clear evidence for uh, water behind uh, meters or tens of meters below the surface of Mars at current time. So uh, even Mars Global Surveyor observations of the borders of some of the craters reveal the presence of this, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, structures that are changing over time, and this evidence for salty light. Um, um, kind of uh, streams that are able to uh, be released from the deep um, part of the of the surface of Mars. So this is uh, really suggesting that m water is very abundant in Mars. You know also the discovery, the recent discovery in the south pole of Mars of a lake in depth. So this is uh, really uh, making uh, Mars a wonderful um, uh, exploration uh, goal for the future missions. Uh, and in fact, we are now also studying some of these primitive uh, echondrites like Alan Hills 8401. Uh, we were particularly studying here, it's not very easy to see, but these are some carbonate globules that you can see here um, with different layers. And what we discovered is that the carbonate globules were um, accreting in different uh, stages with different chemistry. And this means that when this orthopyroxenite, this particular meteorite was forming part of the surface of the Mars was shocked by water in different times and as a consequence of different um, you know elemental dissolutions was able to precipitate and grow in little by little with different chemistry. So this is also pointing that four giga years ago in the surface of Mars we have also water in significant abundance to produce all this fascinating chemistry in the interior 
uh, of, of meteorites. I put here some, um, some slides um, just comparing some of the uh, you know, different meteorites from Mars we know with the uh, recent uh, studies by the pathfinders, you know. Um, I will skip this for just matching the, the time. Then we have uh, the stony iron meteorites uh, in which you have uh, this uh, metal with uh, silicates like palasites, so fascinating meteorites with the specific um, oxygen uh, ratios that are just uh, allowing us to, to see what, are, what is the relation between these uh, metal meteorites. The fascinating thing of this uh, Stony irons and the irons meteorites that they, when you have an um, iron meteorite that is relatively easy to buy no? in, the, uh, in some meteorite shops, uh, uh, you have a piece of a planetary body. You have in your hands a clear proof that uh, planetary bodies were disrupted in huge collisions over time and you are just getting a piece of a core or a mantle eh, when you have a palisade in your hands. So uh, fascinating. And just, uh, just to end a little bit about giant planets concerning these so different planets to the terrestrial ones. You have gas rich uh, planets, um, particularly hydrogen and helium, Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune, uh, more ice-rich um, planets. How they were formed? We think um, perhaps some kind of uh, mixing uh, models could be the best way to understand this, um, probably by fast accumulation of many of these uh, cometesimals, so um, with getting some big uh, cores over time but also probably, as particularly Jupiter and Saturn, that were formed very quickly, probably um, just uh, were having, um, you know, they grew from the uh, gravitational instabilities in the disk, as Professor Maynet was uh, also suggesting this morning. So, in general, we have that these uh, giants were the first planets in our solar system. And as I explained you, they, they probably have a very important role in the uh, evolution of the solar system. But these planets by themselves contain planetary bodies, the satellites. And remember for the future that some of these satellites were oceanic walls. Um, good example in the Gal Galilean satellites, uh, EO is too close, is too affected by gravitational, you know, tidal uh, effects of Jupiter. But Europa, Ganymedes, and Callisto probably were oceanic walls, were covered by water. In the same time, you know, there is clear evidence we have space mission of NASA going to Europa. And there is clear evidence for water in the interior of Europa. And again, if we look at the largest satellites, particularly in Saturn, uh, with Titan, with the, all this complex chemistry of the overdense Titan um, atmosphere, um, we really realize uh, how important was also the arrival of volatiles to these planetary bodies. And just uh, I just bring you some other question to think about it. When we compare Titan versus Earth, we realize with the, you know, deuterium, hydrogen, carbon-12, carbon-13, and nitrogen-14, nitrogen-15, oxygen-16 to 18, you see this is the comparison with the ratios in the atmosphere of the Earth. And you see that is a very good match. Huh? This can be a consequence of irradiation, but if we look to the molecular nitrogen, it's still close to the values in Earth's atmosphere. And what does this mean? 
well, somehow, perhaps, we have that the origin of the volatiles in the planetary bodies surrounding Jupiter and Saturn is the, it was the same origin than in Earth and Mars and other planets. So they were consequence of this scattering of uh, uh, volatile rich objects over, over time. And of course we still have a lot track to go and that's the last uh, slide uh, with the recent mm, studies of the Pluto system, you know, by New Horizon, um, also suggest, suggesting that these uh, bodies could have been oceanic in the past. So uh, this uh, brings us many other astrobiological, uh, fascinating places to visit in our own solar system. So thank you very much for your attention.